Hi, welcome to Alliance for Science Live. I'm Joan Conroe, and we have a great panel today uh, talking about conspiracies in the age of COVID. And our moderator today will be Mark Linus. He's based in the UK, he's a science author, um, and he's also the resident misinformation and conspiracy expert here at the Alliance. He recently wrote a post about the top 10 conspiracies that has gotten hundreds of thousands of views. So Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Joan, um, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Now, obviously, we are all quite used to the fact that we're living within a pandemic. Um, a few months ago, this was a, this was a novelty. Um, uh, and um, I want to focus today's webinar on the issue of misinformation, uh, what the World Health Organization has called a, myth, uh, a misinfodemic, if you like, or infodemic. And the sort of strange politics of, that we're living with at this time seem to, have, seem to have brought forward conspiracy theories in just about every aspect of the of the pandemic and uh, which come into uh, a lot of the politics these days seems to be focused around conspiracy theories and various populist tropes of one sort or another, uh, mentioning no names like the President of the United States. Um, but so I think we've, we've got a really fantastic lineup of experts here today who are going to uh, weigh in on this. Um, we've got 90 minutes um, and uh, please send in your questions. We can, we've got time on Facebook, we can hear from everybody, so please do get involved. Um, quickly go through the participants today. I see we've just been joined by Bright Simons, who's a Ghanaian social innovator, entrepreneur, um, and president of uh, M Pedigree, which, uh, well, Bright, you can tell us more about that in just a second, uh, as well as um, vice president of Imani, which is a Ghanaian think tank. And um, we've got Whitney Phillips, who's assistant professor at the um, Department of Communicational and Communication and Rhetorical Studies at Syracuse University in the United States. We've got Joanne Miller, who's Assistant Professor at the Department of Political Science and International Relations and the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University of Delaware, also in the United States. And we've got John Cook, Research Assistant Professor, Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University in the US. Um, and finally, but not least, Stefan Landowski, uh, Chair of Cognitive Psychology at the um, School of Psychological Science in the University of Bristol. Um, so a fantastic lineup. If I can start with uh, you, Whitney, you were quoted in the New York Times fairly recently talking about how Bill Gates, who full disclosure is one of the, well, by the Gates Foundation is one of the funders of the Alliance for Science here at Cornell, um, has been transformed into this kind of conspiratorial meme because he's he's so well known and you also talk about this concept of polluted information can you tell us a bit more about what you think this means and what it says about the times that we're living in oh all these questions are always so big um so to start with how i frame and approach some of these issues i tend not to use i mean in some instances i will but broadly when i'm talking just about the concept writ large i i, I don't use mis or disinformation to describe um, the informational challenges that we face um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, it's often hard to tell the difference between mis and disinformation just by looking that misinformation is false and misleading information that's inadvertently spread and disinformation is purposefully spread. But just because it started out as one thing doesn't mean it can't transform into another thing depending on who shares it and why. And so it just gets kind of tricky to parse why something is being spread and therefore what the best response to it might be that if somebody is deliberately sharing false information that would warrant a different intervention a different response than someone who was sharing it because they're genuinely trying to help and they just don't realize that it's false so i use instead um, the concept of polluted information that's from my recent um will be published in 2021 but has already been open access published book through MIT Press with Ryan Milner, you are here, a field guide for navigating polluted information. And that, that talks about information from an ecological perspective. So rather than distinguishing between this and this, um, focusing on intentionality, it focuses on downstream consequences and focuses on the broader media ecological um, uh, impacts of this kind of information, regardless of why it started in a certain place, 
it travels often um, in an undetected way, or at least it travels without people realizing what, uh, what kinds of damage it is causing at the moment or um, potentially downstream. So it allows you to have kind of broader conversations, not just about the polluted thing, not just about the Bill Gates story or the elements, the variations on that story, but why that story is allowed to spread, how and why it's incentivized to spread through social uh, platforms, you know, how the attention economy factors into that, how existing beliefs collide with um, sort of algorithmic docenting, um, ego, uh, uh, ecosystems, um, and other sorts of filter bubbles. So it just allows us uh, polluted information to have bigger conversations, um, more ecologically focused conversations, rather than getting into the specific details of every iteration of the Bill Gates narrative. And that, that can be important and meaningful to do, but sometimes we want to be able to talk about the broader landscape um, in which this unfolds and not get so caught up in the individual details that we end up having smaller conversations as opposed to bigger conversations. Right, right. So Joanne, you've spoken a lot already in the media and elsewhere about the conspiracy theories generally and how they relate to COVID. Give us a kind of primer on conspiracy theories, what the novelty is of the current situation or whether we're basically just seeing the repeat of conspiratorial narratives that have been around since the Middle Ages. So I would say that it's probably more the latter than the former, that there isn't much new here except for the content of them. But what we know about one of the main sort of causes of conspiracy theory endorsement is uncertainty. And so we've got kind of the perfect storm right now of a, of a pandemic where people have lost their jobs, their kids are at home, they don't know how they're gonna juggle webinars with kids running around in the background. And um, that type of uncertainty leads all of us to, to, to seek out explanations. And when we're seeking out explanations, we're doing so because we wanna gain some control back. And if we can explain the event, we can potentially rein it in. We know what to do to avoid getting sick potentially or to prevent these things from happening in the future. The downside to that very natural process of seeking out explanations is that sometimes we can go down the path of a conspiracy theory. We, we can connect dots that shouldn't be connected. So we see that lots of 5G towers are being built in China and the virus originated in China. And we put those two things together and say 5G towers are spreading the virus, which to be very clear, they're not. Um, but that process is very, that what we're seeing now with COVID conspiracy theories is um, similar to what we see as the cause of conspiracy theories going back in time. And there are other predictors in some of my research, um, and we can talk about them um, as we go through uh, the conversation today. But uh, the, the class of the conspiracy theories that we're seeing now, I'm finding in, in my research and others are finding as well, are all coming from the same place of un uncertainty, at least from that situational uncertainty that the pandem pandemic is has caused. Right, right. Um, um, Bright Simons, thanks for joining us. Um, you're in Ghana, I think, at the moment. Um, so very, very good to have you with us. Um, your um, organization, M Pedigree, which I think is a Skoll Awardee for so social entrepreneurship, and your focus there was, I believe, on giving people access to information, to genuine information about medicine so that they could send a text and they could find out what, whether what they were buying was fake or not. I mean, what's the kind of relationship between kind of fake news and fake medicines and just the general, you don't know who to believe that we're, you know, seeing at the moment? So, um, I, like you mentioned in the very beginning, I do a bit of think tanking and I'm also an entrepreneur. So I'll give a practitioner's response and then I will venture into uh, the academic terrain. If you think of medicines, fake medicines, um, you think back to the Middle Ages, the, you might recall there was a huge trade in uh, fake relics. So people will say this was the, the bone of, uh, from the middle finger of John the Baptist, or this is the hair that Jesus Christ's mother uh, left on the tomb or whatever. And fake relics was a massive, massive thing. And the church had to pass canon law to try and to suppress it. And then we move into indulgences, which was like another big, huge thing, where the church needed to build these giant cathedrals 
Uh, and to do so, they have to sell these indulgences. Um, and obviously, it didn't take too long before you have fake indulgences. Um, and the popes were very angry because it was denying uh, the money to build these cathedrals. And we've continued with fake stuff until we currently have this crisis of fake medicines, killing hundreds of thousands of people. More people have died of fake um, anti-malaria medicines than have died of, um, of, of COVID so far, if you consider the, the beginning of these records being kept. So it's a huge problem. And the challenge that has arisen is that you need to authenticate what medicine is genuine and which, is, which isn't. Um, and that can be very simple uh, when it comes to trying to find out whether it's a falsified package. So if it's not made by the right manufacturer and what is on there is not what it is, then it's fake. But it gets very more complicated when you start to think about things like substandard medicine. So when it's not about who made it, but about whether the stuff in there maps to some particular benchmark of quality, then it gets extremely esoteric. And we come to something somewhat closer to the discussion that we're having now, which is how do you determine what is fake and what is not fake? And here now I'm, 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 I'm venturing into the academic. If we start to look at this as a more epistemological question, knowledge structures themselves, and how we come to accept some types of knowledge and not others, we enter into an interesting domain. So to give you an example, when I was younger, um, my area of intervention was not actually medicines at all. My first social entrepreneurial forays uh, was into organic and fair trade certification. So how do you say this particular tomato was grown with less chemicals and therefore it's healthy, etc.? cetera. Um, and I was trying to figure out ways to make that easier. I discovered on a trip to California uh, where I went to see the Soil uh, Association people. That it was called Slow Food Movement. Fascinating group. And they took me to a vineyard. And in this vineyard, they had grapes growing. And I started to have a conversation about what they were allowed to put on the grapes and what they were not allowed. Because you still have to keep pests away, right? You have to keep pests away. They're not allowed to do one thing, but they're allowed to do another. So one of the things I discovered then was that I think copper sulfate, a type of, a type of copper sulfate, was allowed as a way of managing pests. So I started to dig into how they've come to this conclusion that certain type of chemicals were organic and or organic compatible and other types of chemicals were not organic compatible. It turned out that there was no scientific grounding whatsoever. Uh, in the decade following, I've also come to discover that there's no real scientific evidence that fair trade makes people better. That you know, it doesn't make the lives of poor people better or that organic food doesn't really make you any healthier. There are a lot of vegetarians around the world who think meat is extremely bad for you. Uh, the science behind eating meat is somewhat uh, inconclusive. Now, why does these things matter? They matter because when we look at people that believe in whether it's um, organic food or whether they believe that you have to be vegan, and we compare them to people that don't believe in, say, vaccines and the rest of it, the epistemological structure is not fundamentally different. In both cases, we are dealing with inaccuracies. However, there is a certain Kantian meta-rationalism that means that we focus on the consequential effects like Whitney described, and we say this is generally, even though it's untrue or may not be grounded in the best of evidence, is generally driven by better motives. So we don't have a problem with people who, are, who promote organic food or people who promote fair trade products or people who promote veganism, even though scientifically their claims may not be accurate. Even homeopathic uh, medicine, some of those claims are not very funny, but we don't really have a lot of challenges with them because fundamentally we are dealing with consequential ethics. My only disclaimer is that before you are able to rely on consequential ethics in order to say, yeah, it's my meta-rationality, and even though evidence is not everything, I still accept this. The only way you can do that is to have some kind of intuitive ethics, some kind of moral compass that enables you to say, this type of misinformation causes more harm, and this other type of misinformation does not cause harm, and therefore it's innocuous. So this notion of the innocence of uh, misinformation must somehow be grounded in a kind of Kantian uh, ethical framework. And that is only then that the consequential ethics makes sense. Because without that morality, you can say, okay, I accept that uh, people that are promoting organic food have a certain rationality for it, but I disown the rationality of people that are promoting um, anti-vaccine behavior. Right, okay. So it's the kind of uh, good intentions versus malign intent, which motivates people to, to trust or not to trust. Um, I want to bring in John Cook at this stage. Um, John, you've done a lot of work on the issue of 
of scientific consensus, particularly regarding climate change. And, you know, it brings up the idea of what the experts think. And if you can prove that there's a consensus of the experts, your paper, I think back in 2013, that you were lead author of, um, had, I think, the famous 97% figure. 97, so we were sort of invited to believe, I suppose, that if 97% of experts thought something, then the rest of us should pretty much go along with it. Um, that kind of trust the experts thinking is, is getting more and more difficult to sustain. So just give us a bit, I don't know, give us a bit of your, your, your updated thinking on, on this whole issue. Yeah, um, well, I guess the first thing is to clarify that ours wasn't the first study to find 97% consensus either. We weren't even the second. So there were, <laughs> there were multiple studies finding it. Uh, and I think it's, it's important when we communicate consensus to the public that we also communicate that science isn't a monolith and we don't understand everything to the same degree. And so there are, there are areas where we have a strong understanding like human caused global warming. And then there are other areas where scientists are at the edges of knowledge and just figuring it out and communicating those, those uh, subtleties between high understanding and low understanding uh, are important for the public to understand um, because uh, because like science deniers often try to attack these fundamental facts of, of science, things that we've known for decades, that um, there's not only a consensus among scientists, but there's a consensus of evidence. There are, there are decades and decades of research. So uh, it's, it's not just enough to communicate that there's agreement amongst scientists or even agreement amongst lines of evidence. Uh, I think people need to also understand how science works and so, so there's, there's a lot to communicate but if i have like a if I have like 20 seconds and i'm on an elevator and i have that much time to explain to somebody um one thing about uh, climate change it probably would be that there's um there's consensus amongst experts because there's a lot of psychological research uh, done by my colleagues at um george mason and yale that have found that uh, what the public think about experts is what we call a gateway belief it has this flow on effect. And if the public understand that the experts agree on a certain element of science, then that um, increases their acceptance of, of other things like experts agree on human caused global warming. They're more uh, accepting that climate change is happening and that we need to do something about it. Right. I wonder though, and I'll um, ask you to weigh in on this, Stefan, whether a consensus of experts can look to somebody who isn't trusting like a conspiracy of some sort and plus you you know look, let's look at the psychology of this where conspiracy theories come from and the fact that the less evidence there is in you know actual evidence in support of the conspiracy all that says to the conspiracy theorist is how effective the conspirators have been in covering it up so evidence isn't you know is, is actually plays in, in the opposite direction there so you know what's the, what's the psychology here Stefan? Well, absolutely. I mean, first of all, yes. Uh, in fact, John Cook and I wrote a paper on precisely that point that um, some people, if they learn about the consensus among scientists about climate change, they, they are not adjusting their belief in climate change, but they're reducing their trust in the scientists because they think, ah, oh, these guys are all in it for the money or to create the world government or whatever. So, for, for some people, that a tiny number, but nonetheless, you know, notable share of the population, uh, the consensus can be interpreted as, as a conspiracy theory. Um, and when you delve into how people uh, uh, construct these conspiracy theories, you do find some very interesting regularities that are, um, you know, the same no matter what the content of the conspiracy theory is. And I think Joanne earlier hinted at that, that really there's nothing new under the sun. All conspiracy theories kind of, you know, have the same purpose. And they also, it turns out, have the same structure. So, um, and for example, one of the things that characterizes conspiracy theories is that they're usually incoherent. Um, you know, you, you dig into a theory, just scratch surface a little bit and then you find that there are mutually contradictory elements there. So for example, climate deniers will say, oh, well, you know, thermometers don't really measure temperature and not accurately enough and there's no way we can ever know what global temperature is. 
But then 10 seconds later, they'll say, oh, don't worry about global warming. It's actually been cooling for the last 10 years or whatever. Now, you, that doesn't hang together. If you can't measure temperature, how can you know it's cooling? Um, and yet these contradictory elements are just put together under the umbrella of a conspiracy theory. And the people who subscribe to the theory are uh, perfectly happy with that. And, and there are other examples of this with um, COVID, for example, uh, where, you know, the same person will be interviewed about this weird conspiracy. And on the one hand, they'll say, oh, well, you know, we've had the virus since we were children because it was given to us through vaccinations and it's now being activated by masks somehow. On the one hand, complete nonsense, but that's what they say on the one hand. But on the other hand, five minutes later, they'll say, oh, it's actually a biological weapon that was developed last year in a lab in China. Now, the, you know, it can only be one or the other. As it turns out, neither of those is true. But putting the two together is incoherent, and that is a marker of conspiratorial thought. Now, I think that's actually useful to know for the public because it gives them a chance to look at what people say and to identify from their rhetoric whether they're likely to have a point or not. And one of the things we know from you know, centuries of philosophy um, and logic is that if things are incoherent, they're, um, they're basically not true. They can't be true. The earth is either flat or round, it can't be both. And so I think these rhetorical markers are a very useful thing to draw people's attention to so they can make a judgment about whom to believe. Right. Um, Joanna, you're, you're back, I see. Um, <laughs> does, does conspiratorial thinking belong to any part of the political spectrum? Um, and I'm not just thinking about the US Republicans here on, on climate and, and more recently on COVID, but or is it something about being fundamentally human and something to do with, you know, a, a sense of powerlessness and, and, and these kinds of more fundamental um, um, aspects? So um, two things here, and I dropped out right as Stefan was talking about contradictory um, conspiracy theories and contradictory elements within the same conspiracy theory. And I dropped out just as he started to talk about COVID. Um, so I may be repeating here, but I have a piece that just came out in the Canadian Journal of Political Science that measured belief in 11 COVID conspiracy theories, some of which are completely contradictory from one another. That the virus was accidentally released by the US and that it was a biological weapon intentionally created by China. Um, those are positively correlated uh, with one another. Uh, uh, in, you know, I've got something like 35% of people think that it was both definitely and probably accidentally or intentionally created by China, for example. Um, these beliefs hang together as a monological system. Um, if you believe one, you believe others. And what that tells me is that they're serving a psychological purpose, and I've talked about uncertainty, um, and they're, they're kind of interchangeable in that sense, um, that um, they're all serving that, that same purpose. And we can talk about what that means about trying to debunk them uh, later, and I hope we get into that, um, that, that discussion. Um, but in terms of... Uh, other features of, of who believe. Uh, what I would, and the way I characterize this is that there are um, common psychological motives um, rooted in uncertainty and powerlessness, um, but there are also people differ on some predispositions, um, whether it's a tendency to deny official accounts of events or the tendency to just in general ex explain events as you know, as being the result of a conspiracy. And those dispositions, and we don't yet have a good handle on what determines why someone may be predisposed, say, for example, to conspiratorial thinking or to um, denialism. Um, but those kinds of things, what I'm finding in some of my research, again, published a different piece, published at Canadian Journal of uh, Political Science, these things interact. So if you have predisposition, it's amplified when the situation makes you feel uncertain. Um, and so we've got these interactions between what we might talk about as features of people and also features of, that, that interact with the changing um, um, context. 
Um, I would also add to this, just real quick, what um, you mentioned um, um, the uh, political correlates. When it comes to COVID, I'm seeing, and others are seeing um, in the US in particular, and also in other countries, that right-leading folks are more likely to believe these conspiracy theories. I don't think that's, um, I, but the research also says that that's not a general, it's not just that people on the right always believe conspiracy theories more than people um, on the left. This particular context, especially in the US, is one where we have a Republican president who's widely criticized. Um, and so that, again, that situation where Republicans are kind of on the outs on this issue uh, is also ramping up conspiratorial thinking um, in, this, in this particular context. Right. Stefan, did you want to yeah, come back on that? Very, uh, I, I agree with virtually all of that, except the, uh, the very last bit. I don't know if you know this, Joanne, but a paper just came out about a week ago or so by Sander van der Linden and colleagues okay. who looked at this symmetry issue using um, instruments or questionnaire items that weren't asking people to endorse specific conspiracies, but to sort of probe their suspicion or tendency to assume that dark forces are controlling the world. So it was a more generic mm -hmm. assessment of conspiratorial attitudes. And he ran several very large sample, very nice studies, and they all, uh, um, you know, found asymmetry such that people on the political right are more likely to en endorse this sort of slightly paranoid way of thinking about, you know, the world and, and the forces controlling it. So um, I think what's happening, actually, somebody made a great comment about the study on Twitter. It's like a Nike hook, you know, the thing on, the, on their shoes, which is sort of symmetrical, but it's kind of slanted one way. And I think that's what's going on. At the extremes, you find conspiratorial thinking on both left and right, but, but there is a sort of a lean to that totally. symmetry. Yeah, sure. yeah, I'm, I'll come to you in just a sec, Whitney, but I wanted just to observe, you know, I've, I've had personal experience of this as well, um, having been involved in the GMO wars and the climate wars. Um, the climate denialism is obviously a, a primarily a phenomenon of the right. Uh, Anti-GMO stuff and the denial of science on GMO safety is predominantly of the left, but not exclusively so. And I know there's work out there which suggests it doesn't stack up anything like as as, in, as politicized as, uh, as as say climate has. And and vaccines now seems to be almost transferring from the left, where you've got the you know the the kind of people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who are sort of big democratic sort of uh, figures who are now becoming kind of on the pro-Trump side of the, of the conspiratorial right as well. But um, so Whitney, what did you want to come in on, on that issue? Yeah, so in the book that we just, my uh, Ryan Milner and I just published, we're looking a lot at far-right conspiracy theories and we're not coming at the conversation from a psychological perspective per se, we're looking at the history of media. And that gives a sort of a, 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 a nuanced entry point into considering why it would be people on the right would be more inclined to believe these kinds of conspiracy theories that has nothing to do with whether or not they're, you know, that sometimes the inclination is to cast dispersions over people who believe these theories or call them not smart um, in, in various uh, more generous and less generous ways. And that's not what we're interested in doing, but rather looking at the history of media in the United States and in, in our context, the US context in particular, um, starting in the early mid 20th century, you begin to see a movement on the right, especially evangelical Christian right, um, moving away from mainstream media because media and society more broadly was becoming more secularized. And so then what these folks, especially these evangelicals, realized is that the only way they were going to get to consume the media that they wanted to consume is that they would be, they would have to do it themselves. So there started to be, um, and this began sort of in the 20s with radio networks, but became increasingly prominent um, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, an increasingly robust far-right media ecosystem that was catering to the sort of evangelical perspective that was not being reflected in mainstream culture. So for decades and decades and decades, you had this sort of cultural media wraparound effect, whereby it wasn't just that they, you know, they needed their own media, it was that increasingly you could not trust 
the information that was coming out of the mainstream because it was anti-Christian and not just, I mean, so to say that it's anti-Christian, that's not strong enough. There was a sort of an apocalyptic element to this, that it was us versus them in a, in a you know, a, it is good and evil, right? And the mainstream media was on the evil side. So you have this cultural tradition of mistrusting things that were coming out of the mainstream and that, that normalizes the sense that if the mainstream is saying it, and that includes scientists, that includes educators, that includes people within the entertainment media, right? That those things are inherently suspect. And so then you have, again, this decades and decades of, of this tradition of not trusting mainstream elements. So then when you have yourself, that, that's not new, but what is new is our, our digital landscape. And then you think about, well, who would be more inclined to try to Google for truth? What group of people would, would see what CNN or the New York Times, or the Washington Post or whatever sort of center, center left mainstream outlet, whatever they're seeing or whatever they're saying, a certain group of people would be more inclined to say, well, I just don't trust that. Fundamentally, there's something about this. There has to be something else. We're not being told everything. They're gonna be the ones who go to Google and ask questions. They're gonna start being siphoned towards alternative explanations of things. So it's not that conservatives are less capable of critical thinking at all. It's that you have sort of media history, media traditions, and then cultural norms directing some people more um, frequently than those on the center left who are less inclined to reject the mainstream out of hand. Um, so thinking about all of those factors at play, that's why looking at the specific conspiracy and looking at the individual person and, and what they believe and why, um, but situating that within these sort of broader media traditions um, and shifts over time and the way that digital media just amplify and exacerbate all of these issues, that's what gives you a clearer picture of a conspiracy theory um, and is again, why I think the ecological framework is, is helpful in that regard. Right, right. So, I mean, the this is the kind of the Fox News thing, I suppose, where the right retreats into its own bubble and maybe the left has, I don't know, CNN or MSNBC in the American context. Um, Bright Simons, is this, is this a primarily American phenomenon or do you see similar kinds of trends maybe facilitated by the online space happening in, in Africa as well? Interesting. I mean, we have um, our divides, ideological divides. Um, if you think of Pan-Africanist, um, some extreme Pan-Africanist, or people that are um, anti-imperialist and therefore tend to see everything in the world um, as designed to perhaps populate Africa or you know um, suppress Africa in some way. There, there are those debates are interesting, and typically they will filter into a discussion around the Gates Foundation and its role in Africa. You find out that radical Pan Africanists um, are just more likely to be automatically predisposed to the view that they have an, a nefarious agenda. But there is a depopulation agenda, um, and that depopulation agenda can then filter into different types of uh, practical manifestations, whether it's to do with um, um, vaccines or it's to do with GMOs or even climate change could be interpreted as just an attempt to prevent Africa from catching up after Europe has spent so much um, um, coal and industrialized on the back of coal. So yeah, these other interpretations um, are, are powerful. So in a sense, you can say you have a scientific structure, that's which is why I go back to this point about epistemology. You can have a, a knowledge structure that successfully contain um, how you think about um, climate change. But other people don't have to, you know, maintain that knowledge structure. If they started off from a purely political economy point of view, um, the, the scientific evidence may not be as important. Uh, so so th that can be interesting. The other point I wanted to make also was this notion of expertise. Uh, and here, um, I'm a bit uneasy about Stefan's point around contradiction. Because when you look at a lot of those types of conspiracy theories that move closer to the fantasy end of the spectrum, so if you think of, say, millenarian fantasies or other types of fantasies uh, or some of those fantasies that are religious in origin but have moved beyond religious. So think of Scientology or a nation of Islam beliefs around, um, you know, hidden other ships that are going to uh, enrapture all of us and, and how the world therefore should be structured. You will find that they're incredibly generally self-consistent. Mm -hmm. So if you were, for instance, to take any of those types of conspiracy and we to look for internal contradictions, you will not find many. The problem is that they just simply divorce from the knowledge structures that most of us operate within. And I wonder whether, you know, we, we, you know how we think of those types of uh, conspiracy theories. 
in Africa, for instance, we have a very strong um, movement um, that are kind of really convinced that, so you have people that are worried about the Council of Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, etc. in the US. We have a variant where there's a belief in new colonialism, which is a perfectly valid uh, political economy construct. But neo colonialism, where it's believed that there are you know, groups of people in the global north that control Africa from the global north and are completely in command of everything that happens in Africa. And often they are pet in the Bretton Woods institution. Uh, and none of it doesn't make sense, but they are very internally consistent. And I think, therefore, that rather than to think of uh, internal contradictions as being a clear marker, it would be interesting to look at orthodoxy, counter orthodoxy, and also the movement from orthodoxy to orthopraxy. So on the one hand, if you purely, it's purely about belief, as opposed to purely about action-oriented models of behavior, you find that it's very interesting the way that the conspiracy then evolves. So if it's just about what you believe, as opposed to how we should run things, I find that a lot of times the conspiracy theories then dissolve. So to give you an example, if you believed that 5G was somehow responsible for uh, coronavirus um, and its spread, and then you were asked to somehow help solve the COVID problem, and you find out that it doesn't translate easily. So the, the belief doesn't translate into actions that are consistent. Whereas the belief can be internally so consistent. So if I ask someone, okay, um, how, do I, how are we gonna address this COVID-19 problem? What are the specific actions and steps? You find that a lot of the people, the beliefs start to devolve from the action. So the same people that don't think that, you know, this disease even exists, start to become very worried when they have to, um, they, they start getting symptoms. And then their practice, their behavior, significantly diverges from their, their thoughts. Um, and it's an interesting way to look at it that, that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, Stefan, I'll let you come back to this in a sec. But John, perhaps you can help us. Uh, I know you co-authored this um, handbook on conspiracy theories, but can you remember what, what's the mnemonic where you remember what the factors are that characterize a conspiracy theory? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I can't remember it offhand. Well, I mean, the reason why we developed an acronym was to remember it if we did get put on the spot. So, <laughs> so, so the acronym is CONSPIRE. And Contradictory is, is just one of the seven traits of conspiratorial thinking. And, and, and I mean, I think Brian is completely right. Like not all conspiracy theories are contradictory, but uh, that's why it's important to, to be aware of these other traits as well, which is um, overriding suspicion, nefarious intent, um, the idea that something must be wrong. They always, even if they change the elements of their conspiracy theory, they still believe that the, they have this unshakable belief that the mainstream account must be false. Um, the, there's persecuted victimhood is often seen amongst conspiracy theorists. They're immune to evidence, so trying to uh, present evidence that contradicts their conspiracy theory is usually interpreted or reinterpreted as confirming the conspiracy theory. And they reinterpret randomness, which is something that um, I think Joanne spoke about earlier. They connect dots that um, um, random dots that really uh, are not appropriate to connect. Right, because I mean, there are real conspiracies. I mean, there's uh, actual occasions where powerful people do get together and do uh, cook up plots, which can have a pretty damaging impact on the rest of us. So it's, you know, it's again, how you, how you determine, <laughs> how you determine yeah. the real thing from the, from mm -hmm. the, uh, just the theory. And, and real conspiracies do exist are the first words in the conspiracy theory handbook. And so right. we begin by saying, here are these telltale traits of conspiratorial thinking. Here are the traits of conventional thinking that have uncovered real conspiracies. And understanding the difference between the two is, is key to being able to apply critical thinking to assess whether a conspiracy theory may be valid or not. Right, so um, just again, before we come back to Stefan, Whitney and, and Joanna may be bright too. Do, do those, does the CONSPIRE acronym, does that work for you? in terms of the different traits of conspiratorial thinking. They were, uh, I've forgotten them now, I can't go through them all, but we, you just said, <laughs> you just said John go through them. Did any of those jump out at you as being, oh no, I don't, I don't go with that one? No, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the handbook and it's, a, and it's a great primer on all of this work and I would recommend it um, highly. Um, and absolutely, I, it, it resonates with me and the political psychology research that I and others um, have, have done on the sort of correlates and predictors uh, of these beliefs. Um, I would say where I might diverge a little bit, not too much, but 
uh, is on the part of the discussion in the handbook about um, ways to debunk um, conspiracy theories. And this is where Stefan and I um, may disagree is a strong word, but I would emphasize, I, I would place emphasis a little bit differently. Um, and this is, my thinking on this is evolving a bit as I'm seeing in the research with the COVID-19 conspiracy theories about how tightly knit this structure is. Um, and that I've been using the phrase, um, attempting to debunk one is kind of akin to a feudal game of whack-a-mole, um, where if the, um, and I think I'm Sure. Oh, yeah, I think, I think we, lost, we lost John for a second there, yeah, thanks. Um, he was about to reveal something and the, <laughs> the conspiracy got to her. Yeah, I think Elizabeth oh, just, oh, 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 <laughs> just rewind, rewind about 30 seconds. About 30 seconds. Um, so um, given how tightly knit this structure is of these beliefs, uh, attempts to debunk any one of them, um, I've, been, I've been joking that it's kind of like a game of whack-a-mole uh, where you can, uh, point out logical fallacies, for example, or, 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 or provide factual arguments that may chip away at a particular conspiracy theory. But if the psychological needs that gave rise to the belief in the first place still exist, there's always another conspiracy theory waiting around the corner. And if you think about the information environment as well, and um, that um, folks have sort of funneled themselves into particular media environments, they're, it, they're easy to find. Um, and so I, I'd like to sort of think about short-term versus long-term kinds of, kinds of solutions. We are debunking ones, providing people with the tools to recognize the structure of a conspiracy theory to maybe put their guard up are helpful. Um, but trying to think about ways to tackle the underlying sort of needs or the information environment uh, that give rise to them in the first place um, I think is where my emphasis kind of going is going sort of on the side of how do we counteract or mitigate um, these beliefs. All right, so let's let's get on to the debunking thing in a minute, but first let's finish up on this go around about how we all whether we're all on the same page really about what conspiracies are and and why they why they happen. Uh, Whitney, then then Stefan, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think, and I I really like the um, acronym. I think it's really helpful. Um, I I do think that. It's the randomness. I don't. I don't disagree with that because often you do see these very sort of disparate um, pieces of, I guess, what get framed as evidence who that are connected together that uh, empirically don't belong together. But you know, the thing about conspiracy theories, especially, and I focus on conspiracy theories on the right, so I wanted to sort of make sure that my my focus is is clearly stated um, at what I've looked at specifically they function as a cultural grammar. And so for the people who believe them, they're, they're, it's, it's not random at all. And the way that we talk about it in the book um, is it's the distinction between real and true, um, that for the people who are experiencing information or, or things that happen in the world as evidence, all of that evidence hangs together really beautifully. And that's what makes it so difficult to dislodge the idea. And as a kind of a test case, um, a pre- digital media, social media test case, we look at the satanic panics in the United States, um, in the, which really began in the 60s and 70s, but reached their zenith, so to speak, in the 80s and 90s. And we wanted to use that because it, it's before you have sort of, before digital media kind of complicate things further. But what was happening during that period of time, there was a lot, there were a lot of things that were really happening in the world, really happening in the news that was at the very least giving Satan a lot of um, media coverage. So you would, there were crimes where people were actually like drawing pentagrams and there were things that were, tr that really truly were happening. It's just how was that information being interpreted? And for people who were not standing, we, we use the phrase deep mimetic frame to talk about sort of the structuring ways of seeing um, that don't just uh, situate what people are seeing, but what they feel should be done about it. The people who are not standing behind the deep mimetic frame of evangelical Christianity, all of these things were totally disparate. And the, you know, cult crimes that were happening, that was not connected to the rise in occultist media. And that was not connected to any of the other sort of Satan-y stuff that was genuinely going on at the time. 
they were they were disparate curiosities if they were considered on mass at all but if you were standing behind that deep mimetic frame that just oh, it was further evidence that these things were that that satan was afoot and so it's easy to stand outside of the the conspiratorial um sort of thinking the theory itself and point out all the ways that the dots are not connected and it's important to do that and at the same time you know sometimes it's helpful i think certainly when we've approached um far-right conspiracies and have tried to make sense of it to figure out how can we best respond the question is for for, for us is less why does someone believe this? And it's more a question of why wouldn't someone believe this, given their cultural situatedness, given the media wraparound that they experience, given all the corroborating information that they interpret as evidence, you know, why wouldn't somebody from that framework not interpret these events in this particular way? And that allows you to have a conversation that can both acknowledge when something is empirically not true, because we need to hold on to that, while at the same time, uh, you know, uh, having those bigger conversations about the information landscape and the ways that our information landscapes really influence what is regarded as true versus what is, um, or what is regarded as real versus what is actually true. Okay, Stefan. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree actually with, with a lot of that. And, and I want to pick up, well, two themes. Uh, the first one is that debunking conspiracy theories can be extremely difficult, depending on the audience. Um, and so one of the solutions to that, which, uh, again, John and I have done some work on, and we mentioned this in the conspiracy theory handbook, is to pre-bunk. That is to warn people up front that they might be misled. And there's pretty good evidence now that that, kind of works. People become more resistant to being misinformed if you can tell them ahead of time how they will be misled. Um, so that's one response to, to the difficulties of debunking. But the other issue, and I totally agree with Joanne on that, uh, what we really have to focus on is the global context and the attention economy and the information landscape that we're all exposed to. And it is extremely difficult, especially as a cognitive scientist, to sort of fall into this trap that all we have to do is kind of tweak something and then things will be different. Well, no. <laughs> uh, what we need to deal with is the structure of our online environment and the attention economy. And just to give you a couple of examples, recently YouTube uh, changed their policy and they said, um, we're no longer going to advertise uh, conspiratorial videos or whatever. Um, and that happened overnight without any public debate, any, without any democratic accountability, without any consultation. It just so happened overnight. Now, arguably, that was a good thing to do. But the flip side is also true, and that is that somebody at Facebook can wake up tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. and tweak their algorithm and all of a sudden the world is different. And it can be dramatically different because the algorithms that are you know, curating our news feeds and, and that are delivering information to us, recommend us systems are incredibly powerful and they're completely without, at the moment, without any public accountability. And to my mind, that is something that, that we really have to look at because um, our information diet in the Western world is basically run by algorithms that are generating profit for a few dozen people in Silicon Valley. Now, I'm not saying that they're doing this with any sort of bad intention. I'm, I'm convinced they're sitting there thinking that they're improving a product. But the problem is that we know very little about how these algorithms work. They're extremely difficult to audit. Um, and so we're living in an environment where we, we don't have democratic control over something that is extremely important. And I think that is the issue we have to debate and draw attention to. Right. I mean, there's the democratic aspect to this and there's also the political economy more broadly. And, you know, right, you mentioned that within the African context of some of the conspiratorial type narratives that come up there maybe. But what about conspiracy theories in, uh, as a sort of political economy phenomenon, you know, where the conspiracy theories are a tool of power, if you like, to, you know, to, to, to remove any accountability within the democratic system? I think certainly President Trump's been accused of that. If you can 
get rid of the whole idea of, of truth or of, of any kind of shared reference point for truth, then you can't, then power can't be held accountable in the same way. Um, so this, this is very different from a sort of the grassroots 5G type conspiracy theories, which seem to come up from. So I just wonder whether, uh, I mean- Sorry, uh, just a comment on the grassroots 5G? Uh-uh. That started more than a year ago uh, and it was launched by uh, Russian bots. And it was Putin who started um, these conspiracy theories about 5G in the West, while, of course, building a 5G network in Russia at the same time. That was reported in the New York Times more than a year ago. Um, and it's just people forgot about it because it didn't go anywhere at the time. Right. And now, a year later, with the pandemic, bang, there it was. And all of a sudden, it, it took off. But right. no, it's not yeah, so you've got geopolitical dimensions to this as well. And you can see that in COVID, of course, with the competing conspiracy theories between the US and China about the origin of the virus. So, um, you know, it's, 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 you know, I think there is a distinction to be drawn, though, between this sort of top down and the, the bottom up, if you like. Joanne, did you want to come in on that? I was, I was just going to say, um, I, I think that academically that distinction makes sense. I think it's hard to distinguish in, you know, in, in, in the real world. Um, and I think that we know, um, at least in my part of the political psychology world of studying um, conspiracy theories, we know a lot more about the sort of individual level correlates of belief and not as much about the um, individual level and also more uh, macro level uh indicators of why people share um, and those are not the same thing you don't have to believe to share um they're not they don't necessarily go one and the same and there are there are um uh both cynical and as whitney was talking about earlier um you might be sharing it because you genuinely believe it and you're trying to get it get it out there um, that sharing, I think Bright was talking earlier about sometimes these beliefs don't have actions that are easily attachable to them, like the 5G COVID conspiracy theory. One action is just sharing it, letting other people know that this is what's going on. So although I'm not near a 5G tower, maybe someone else is, and they can set fire to that tower if only they knew that this is what was causing the virus, which again, it's not. Um, that, but but that the, that the there are strategic and we might say cynical, but then also benign reasons for sharing that are either top down or bottom up. So I think these things are kind of crossed, uh, crossed in a way. Um, and with the media landscape, um, the way it is, with the information environment, the way it is, there's profit um, in trafficking, in conspiracy theories. Um, and there's also a political strategic component in weaponizing conspiracy theories um, as a, um, a form of political persuasion um, right. that is more easily able to happen now um, because of the changing media um, landscape. I'm not saying that it's new. <laughs> it's always been here, but um, it may be easier to do now than it was before. So I think there are a couple of things that are crossed here that are difficult to in, disentangle empirically that are maybe easier to talk about, you know, theoretically as distinct. Right. Uh, well, we're coming up to the, we're coming up, yeah, well, just, just quickly, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, we've got half an hour, just over half an hour left. We've got quite a few people who, who are sending in questions. Please, if you're watching and you have a burning question, just pop it in the chat, whatever the question function is, and we'll try and put it to the panelists. Um, Joan, I think, have you got um, some questions there lined up? You can just uh, shout out and we can go around and then, then to our panelists, just, just wave your hand if that's something that, that you'd like to, to address. So Joan, what, what have we got so far questions wise? All right, so I'll just give you one at a time. So the first is how do you break through a cult? They seem to love to wallow in ignorance and stupidity. Cult, so the, the idea that I suppose that um, conspiracy theories that unite a small group of cult type believers. Um, who, who wants to comment on that? So, sure, Whitney. Uh, by not describing them in that way, <laughs> number one. I mean, I think, so I think it's really, really important that we, like I said earlier, that we maintain a 
sense of shared reality, that what is true matters. And especially right now, we cannot have functioning democratic participation if there is no such thing as truth anymore. So we really, really need to make sure that you can say this thing is empirically true and this thing is not. But you need to be able to balance that without totally alienating people with whom you could be having a meaningful conversation that everybody loses people on the left people on the right everybody loses and again i'm speaking to a u.s context if it is not possible to have a conversation with someone who is convinced taken by certain conspiratorial thinking and it is very difficult as we've already hinted at throughout this conversation to find ways to debunk or respond to those conspiracy theories, but calling someone stupid is the number one way to not accomplish that goal. And like I was saying, you know, things, the dots may not empirically be connected, but to, a, to, to the person whose conspiracy theory it is, it does make sense. So how do you engage with that in a way that doesn't hold their hand, that not to not saying that is this in a patronizing way or to say people are different and we can all, you know, we can just believe in the deep state if we want. We all get in trouble when a significant percentage of the population believes in the deep state. How do you communicate in a way that's strategic and takes into account and honors the humanity and standpoint of the person whose conspiracy theory it is, especially when it's very dangerous and, and harmful? So I understand the frustration. It is a deeply frustrating moment figuring out what to do with anger over um, misunder, I don't know, misunderstandings might be too generous. But people are dying because people do not believe that COVID-19 is real or that you can that wearing masks helps like the stakes, the stakes are very high, but that only speaks to how important it is to respond to this kind of thinking strategically as opposed to antagonistically, because that just simply isn't going to work. Okay, um, thanks. Um, Brian, your hand went up too. So, so if you wanted some kind of general theory um, of how you um, frame this problem of conspiracy theories and its relation to politics and the like. I would say that the real thing is about orthodoxy versus autopraxy again. That we had the time, there was a time when you know, who you were um, was extremely important in terms of your origin and the likes of it. We've now moved into a time when what you believe seems to be the defining hallmark of identity. All right, we can't and hear you very well. Can you, sorry, we can't hear you very well. Can you just check sorry, the microphone? Just uh, uh, okay. Is it better now? Uh, just, I don't know, but not not hugely. But just speak up. Just shout anyway. <laughs> okay. So I was saying that we were, there was a time where when where you came from or who you were in that regard as an idea you know, was the primary hallmark of identity. And now we're in an age where like, most predominantly is what you believe in that kind of defines your identity. Uh, and we should be moving more into a world in which what you do defines your identity. So that movement from autonomy to topraxy is the fundamental thing. And the reason why it is this way, if you go back historically and you look at some of the most vicious, the most pernicious conspiracy theories, they were promoted by experts. Just that a lot of these aspects were in bed with state, the state apparatus. So you, you go to Germany under, under, under the Third Reich and you look at what was happening in that period and a lot of the eugenics programs were actively sponsored by German universities. A lot of the racialist theories were endorsed by German universities, including by German academics and experts. So the notion that somehow merely um, allowing expertise to prevail will somehow address the problem is just ridiculous. Politically, it doesn't make sense. On the other hand, if you think of the one determinant that truly distinguishes between the kind of world we all seem to be saying is in the right world from, you know, and the ones that we would like to see emerge is this notion of pro learning, this view of learning constantly, constantly revising your views based on new events coming in the likes of it. Now, constantly learning is not the same thing as absolute deference to expertise, because experts themselves have to learn. They have to be willing to let go of their beliefs. So, its movement from orthodoxy to autocracy requires this constant learning. And it also links to this whole Daniel Kruger thing. Where a lot of people that believe in conspiracies, whether they are experts or not, have this notion that they have a complete model of the world. And that that complete model of the world is somehow static and is capable of explaining everything. This defines conspiracy theories, whether at the level of experts or at the level of ordinary people. The 
truth, however, is that we need to constantly. And if we focus on that learning in order to, to do more effectively, then it doesn't matter whether it's an orthodoxy, which is an orthodoxy by experts that are in the ministry, or a counter orthodoxy, which is a kind of uh, um, uh, movement that is focused on experts that are outside the ministry, who may or may not be experts. I think that is really, as far as I'm concerned, the true uh, nexus of the matter. Okay. Um, before we come back to anyone else, um, Joan, can we get another question? If you've uh, any of the rest of you got thoughts, then bring it into the <laughs> answers of, of the next couple. All right. So the next one is unfounded conspiracies are one thing to help provide education on truth, but what about alleged conspiracies that have truth behind them without sufficient proof? When is a conspiracy theory the legitimate route to proof? A possible example being Russia and the relationship with Trump. It is obvious when there is a volume of circumstantial and more evidence, but how do we justify a conspiracy investigation to conclude truth? Interesting, very interesting. I mean, the, think of the Mueller report. Um, certainly, I guess a lot of the left in the US would probably believe that there was a higher degree of collusion than was than came through in the Mueller report. So maybe that's a conspiracy theory, or maybe it's maybe it's more than that. Um, given that it was looked at, Stefan, yeah. Yeah, no, I'd like to comment on that. I, th I think it's actually, it's a, it's a great question. And it gets back to what we started out with, which is, you know, how do you differentiate a conspiracy theory from a, from a true conspiracy? And I think, to my mind, again, the, the strongest signal there is whether or not people are taking into account evidence along the way. Or do they persist in the absence of evidence or by reinterpreting contrarian evidence? Now, in the Russia-Trump case, what is very interesting is that there was a period of time right after the election when, among Democrats, there was a surprisingly high belief that um, Russia had interfered with voting machines during the election. Uh, and I remember being very concerned about that. It showed up in a Pew survey, and it was published. To, Joanne is nodding. You remember that? Now, uh, that disappeared. That suspicion was not supported by evidence, or at least no one has come up with the evidence so far. So it was dropped. It did not turn into a conspiracy theory that became disembodied from, from evidence. So to me, that's sort of the, the crucial thing. Are people responsive to absence of evidence uh, or contrarian evidence. And if so, then I think they might be on the path even ultimately to discover a true conspiracy, if there is one. But if, they, if they're not sensitive to evidence, that's when I start to worry that we're talking about a conspiracy theory, not anything that's actually out there. Right, um, yeah, John. So I wanna put something that Stefan said and Whitney said um, together here and, and, and amplify it a little bit. And that's that um, we, in studying why people believe conspiracy theories or where conspiracy theories come from, um, we, that very, the, a very act of asking that question sort of says, these are the people that need to be studied. This is the problem. This is what we have to fix. And this is what Whitney was saying um, earlier. Um, but there's the flip side of that, which is that, uh, uh, especially in, 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 in um, democracies or participatory um, democracies, we want people to question government. Uh, and we want people to uh, have a, a high standard uh, for uh, um, uh, government performance. And um, be skeptical, uh, which means that uh, that some of those conspiracy theories are going to slip in as people are trying to explain events or ask, should I really believe that authoritative account of that particular event? Um, and then where where Stephen's point comes in then is that that's a natural thing that happens. Where 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 the divergence occurs is is the people who then. Um, are responsive to the evidence and the ones who aren't, right? And that's where we get um, the point where, you know, we're still gathering evidence or we're still learning. Uh, um, and I think that there is probably still um, more information to be learned about um, the Trump 
Putin Russia um, connection. But like um, Stefan said, the Russia tampering specifically with voting machines fell out of favor because there wasn't any evidence um, of it and that one. And so that's where I think that we need to be careful in when we, when we talk about this to not demonize. And you know, some, some folks would say it's the people who never question who are the ones that we should be worried about, not the, not the ones who do question. Right? And I think that there's something to that there's something to be said for that. Maybe we should be asking a different question, like Whitney said. Why wouldn't people believe? Or I would maybe flip that around and say, why wouldn't people question? Mm -hmm. And maybe they're the people that we need to be worried about. Right, right. Um, sure, Whitney. Then we'll get one more, another question or two. Hopefully. Oh, yeah. Just to sort of um, develop that a little bit further too. That I think that it's really critical to ask again and again and again, um, you know, and also this sort of response to Bright's question too about constantly learning. So, so combining these two sort of ideas, but it's not just, you know, why these conspiracies flourish, why people believe in them, but also how are they allowed to flourish? How can our understanding of the network conditions in which these conspiracies flourish related to the attention economy, related to asymmetric polarization, how can that understanding evolve and grow? And how can we use that to then respond in a way that's more strategic? So I think this the, the point about what questions are we actually asking? Because that's gonna determine what kinds of answers we arrive at. And again, because the stakes are so high, you know, we need we need to start, we need to get it right, or at least we need to be able to start bridging some um, bridging some gulfs. And so what questions we ask matter. Uh, and and yeah kind of asking around the issue rather than just saying like what's the conspiracy why would someone believe something like that there's just other information to glean that's relevant to a lot of different disciplines okay um joan another question for us please all right this starts with a statement then does have a question at the end i think it's important to acknowledge that these frameworks assume the primacy of a western scientific rationalist perspective Many belief systems fall outside that framework and may in fact be immune to evidence provided by that framework. Evidence itself, as we typically deploy it, is an ethnocentric concept. The existence of different conceptions of evidence doesn't necessarily make other belief systems irrational, and it certainly doesn't make them equivalent to conspiracy theories. There are, of course, similar processes at work in the formation and enactment of all belief systems, and relativism has its limits. Maybe the panelists could speak to what those limits should be in these instances. Wow, another great question. Yeah, um, who wants to, question yeah no, who, wants to back off, who wants to start off tackling that one? Too big? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've seen this as well, um, of, you know, the, the, the idea that science is a, well, it's sort of a wholly owned project of the West and that uh, indigenous ways of thinking, as there's different, forms of words which summarize this kind of thing, but are uh, somehow on a separate plane and have different forms of evidence. Um, but um, Bright, um, help me out here. Come in, come in with um, a response to that. So it's, I mean, it's a fascinating question, like you said, um, and I'll, I'll just... Uh, and, and speak up again. We, sorry, we still can't hear you very well. Oh, you can hear me very well? Is no. it better then? That's yes. better. Mm -hmm. I something was okay. over the microphone. Okay. So I was just remembering the, the famous uh, Tahafut by um, Ghazali, the, the philosopher Ghazali, about the confusion of the philosophers. And he, and, and he, was, um, he was a great epistemologist in his own right, obviously from the, from the philosophic tradition that eventually more or less uh, bridged the, the gulf between um, the resurrection or the revival of Greek um, Mediterranean type thought and Western thought eventually. So this very much the tradition of Aviros and all of these um, philosophers from, from that part of the world, which eventually became to dominate Western thought uh, in the early Middle Ages. So I'm not sure that you know, a critical rationalist perspective is entirely Western. I mean, the history doesn't show that it is. Um, whether it's Indian mathematics or Persian philosophy, um, there is a great deal of evidence that critical rationalist perspectives um, are available in many, many disciplines. Sorry, many, many traditions around the world. What is true, though, is that in some societies, this idea of having multiple rationalist frameworks is more tolerable. It's much more tolerable. So, for instance, um, Joe Apia, who is the, the father 
of a very famous Ghanaian philosopher called Kwame Antonia Pia, uh, who plays his trade, I think, in Princeton now, used to believe in dwarfs. And he used to believe in dwarfs as a form of making sense of a lot of the ecological issues that other types of sciences could not deal with in his mind. And he wrote extensively about it. But he was also somebody who took a class at first in classics and was extremely open-minded to the Western notions uh, of science and scientific belief. Now, in some parts of the world, that is still very acceptable. So if you go to India and you are Hindu, um, so you can have a lot of scientists who are perfectly fine with Hindu ethics and they link it to the cosmology and the cosmogony of the Hindu, Hindu universe, and they are perfectly acceptable. I think in the West, you do have a much more monist system now where you have one type of um, overall epistemological model and most educated people are expected to comply. I think in other parts of the world, there is still a certain tolerance for having these multiple perspectives, rational perspectives that operate, which then brings us back to the question, is it not really about what kind of suprarationality enables us to make sense of some competing rationalities? And then to say, look, it doesn't matter that he has a belief in dwarves or a belief in witches, which is very widespread in West Africa, but so long as it doesn't harm people, it doesn't lead to you know, persecution of women, elderly women. Uh, as a result of that, we can live with it. That, I guess, is the challenge. So I think it goes back to this meta-rationality, super-rationality point and competing rationalities, where some ethical framework is needed to determine where the harm is possible because of some of these beliefs. Thank, thank you. That was um, that was fascinating, brilliant response. Um, anyone else want to come into that before we? Yeah, Whitney, sure. Yeah, and this is kind of um, in response to something Joanne said a little bit ago too. You know, it, it's not just so speaking within the Western um, framework. I, I think that sometimes um, there's a tendency to. I don't know, overprivileged rationality to assume that if you just throw enough rationality at conspiracy theorists that they'll they'll write their ways and that's all we need to do. As long as you just teach people critical thinking, the problem is solved. And that's not to say that critical thinking isn't important and that rationality can't be super helpful. But if we're being honest, a lot of the things that we believe, even those of us who believe that we're staunchly rational as beings, that's not always how we process information. And so the idea that everything is purely rational and that those people who believe in conspiracy theories, they lack something. And we just need to fill, that we need to fill that lack, we need to fix them, implies that our decision-making processes are fundamentally inherently rational. And that, mm, that assumption, I think, might miss something. Um, so, so even within a Western tradition, we might, um, I don't know, over, I don't want to say overprivilege it necessarily, but overestimate the degree to which rationality factors into the way we move through the world as individual people. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I thought that was well established by Herbert Simon. Mm. Yeah, well, <laughs> Stefan, go ahead. Well, yes, I mean, totally. We, we know that human cognition isn't necessarily rationally optimal. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm a cognitive scientist. I got a warehouse full of examples of people, you know, using cognitive shortcuts and heuristics that, that, that aren't optimal. But I think um, there, there is a slightly separate question here, and that is whether we know how we can best appreciate and model and understand reality. And I think as far as that is concerned, um, we have an equally full warehouse of evidence to suggest that, you know, considering evidence the way scientists do is on average damn good. I mean, you know, we fly airplanes and have iPhones and that is all <laughs> coming out of a rationalist approach to, to try to understand reality. So, um, and, and so even though individually, you know, we're, we're cognitively, you know, suboptimal creatures, I think as a, as a sort of normative standard, we, we are entitled to say, well, hang on, you know, you're more likely to track reality with your, with your brain if you're coherent rather than if you're incoherent. And, and so I think that's where, where we have to kind of acknowledge both that we're imperfect but we also actually know what what's the right thing to do because we can describe it mathematically we know how optimal bayesian cognition works even if we ourselves don't always conform to that okay can i make a very quick point 
Yeah, very quick. Then Joanne, and then we'll then we'll move on. I was just going to say that it, it comes back to this idea of moving from belief to action. That is the true nexus. If you take societies or cultures that are supposed to be radically different, the Chinese and Americans, and you observe how they actually play out in geopolitics, you see an amazing convergence. And that I think is the is the is the thing. Right. Um Joanne and then Okay, um, two quick things. One, before we end today, I want to make sure that um, we've all talked about uh, um, some of our own work here. I want to give a shout out to a couple of uh, um, academic journals that have, have been doing fantastic work with putting out calls for um, rapidly peer-reviewed academic articles about COVID-19 writ large, not just about conspiracy theories. And I'll, I know three, and if others know others, um, please mention them. Um, Harvard Misinformation Review, and these are all open access online. Um, you don't need a subscription so anyone can access these articles. So Harvard Misinformation Review is one. The Canadian Journal of Political Science is another that I know of. And Politics and Gender um, are all doing rapidly reviewed academic pieces on um, COVID-19. Um, um, and if others know of others, again, um, please uh, mention them. The one thing I just want to uh, say and we've talked a lot about the, the, the arguments and the rationality or the irrationality, or I don't like that word, not um, traditionally rational um, ways of, of thinking. And I like, to, I like to talk about this as, as thinking about the ability side and the motivation side of these beliefs. Um, we can teach people all the critical thinking skills in the world from a Western tradition, um, for whatever uh, 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 traditions and um, with regard to the types of evidence that should be used in order to determine the truthfulness or the truth of something. Um, but the motivation side is a harder nut um, to crack. If you're motivated to believe that thing, you're going to figure out a way to believe it. Uh, even if you are the most rational person who knows all of the critical thinking and all the media literacy um, stuff out there. Um, and so I've been emphasizing more the motivation side in terms of where these beliefs come from and how do we crack that, um, not in the sense of, is it about powerlessness, that maybe it's about transparency um, that we need to, um, and so I just wanna sort of uh, uh, bring that back out here that there, there are two sides of this um, and maybe we tend to focus on the, the rational side more because we're scientists and we have better answers <laughs> to what those arguments might be and how to teach media literacy or how to teach um, critical thinking skills. But the motivation side is harder. Right. And um, actually, you just, sure, you just brought that back to COVID. In fact, I wanted to pause on the questions here and move the conversation back in that direction because we're coming to the end of time now and there's this it's not exactly an elephant in the room. It's the thing that concerns us all at the moment. We've, and John, this is going to come from your way. So just to give you a bit of advance warning, we, we, we are in this pandemic. We have a potential exit route with a vaccination. And yet we have this phenomenon with a, what looks like a resurgence of, of anti-vaccine sentiment. Um, so take this as the, the sort of the archetypal conspiracy theory. What are we going to do to... Um, get into a situation where en enough people do accept a vaccine that we can achieve the levels of immunity we need to defeat COVID-19. Uh, John. Um, I wish I had the answer to that. But it's, a, it's a, probably one of the biggest questions that society is facing right now. Um, and I think that there are, it's a, probably a multifaceted answer and there are multi, multiple audiences that different strategies will work with. And so, so uh, what we our researchers looked at is just one tiny facet of that. I mean, we've we've talked about the limits of critical thinking and and the um, uh, motivated reasoning as as the challenges involved in there. Um, one thing that I find powerful about this approach of inoculation is that it there are two elements to inoculating people against misinformation. There is there is essentially the emotional element and the critical thinking rational element. There is the warning people of the threat that they may be misled. And then there is the counter arguments that explain the fallacies, the rhetorical techniques used in misinformation. And the, the inoculation research has shown that it's actually the warning that does the heavy lifting in inoculation. Both are important, but because most of our thinking is emotional, it's heuristic, it's, it's uh, 
system one fast thinking, that element of inoculating is is um, is really an element. So I think that's preemptively getting ahead of what will be, I think, a flood of of anti-vaccine misinformation as we get closer and closer to a COVID vaccine uh, is an important strategy, but it's not the only strategy. Okay, um, it's just it's it, it. I find it difficult to believe that people wouldn't, in the context of a pandemic, which is already killed half a million people, people would somehow want to refuse the solution to it. I mean, it couldn't, the, the cause and effect couldn't be clearer, much clearer than they are with, say, GMOs, where you can argue, you know, for a long time about how beneficial they may or may not be to farmers in developing countries, that kind of stuff. It's a lot less clear than the vaccination issue is, is obviously in the context of a pandemic. So um, anyone else want to, I, I'd love to have a go around on this, because I think, as you said, John, this is the big one. Um, who, who'd like to come in next? I'll try. I'll. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks, John. Um, so, I think that part of the concern, or part of what will is easily exploitable, say, um, by people who generally are skeptical of vaccines and reject the science. Uh, um, of the uh, effectiveness of vaccines and the, um, that, um, that they're not particularly harmful, is that one of the things that's going to be easily exploitable by people like that is the concern that, that, that scientists are rushing to get a vaccine out. So we've got sort of this double-edged sword. We want a vaccine quickly because we want to stop the spread of this virus that's killing hundreds of thousands of, of, of people and more. And we want that vaccine quickly, but the quicker we get it, the more concern I have that people are going to be worried about the safety of that vaccine. And so, how do we um, bridge that? You know, well, you know, ordinarily vaccines take how many years and how many trials uh, uh, to develop, and this one's happening more quickly. Maybe Bill Gates is making something up that he's got, you know, mind control chips. Uh, in this, whatever they're going to be injecting. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a big concern um, that I saw one study, I wanna say it was Pew, it might've been Pew or um, on one of the other nationally representative sur surveys in the US that said upwards of, I think it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, 40% um, of people in the US said that they wouldn't get vaccinated um, when a COVID vaccine um, comes out. Um, and that's scary. Um, I don't have any answers to um, how we counteract um, counteract that right now, but we're already seeing it. We're seeing um, anti-vaxxers who are saying, well, look, we have less infant mortality than we had before because during this pandemic, people aren't being vaccinated for autism. Um, so they're all, so we don't have to wait for a vaccine to happen for, you know, that the, um, those um, uh, anti-vax um, peddlers are already taking advantage in some sense, I would say, of COVID-19 uh, to build an argument against a vaccine before it comes out. And so the inoculation that John and Stefan talk about needs to be happening now. Right. So Stefan, just, you look like you were just about to come in there and then, then Whitney. Well, I think <clears throat> I'm, I'm not quite as pessimistic as that because... Um, <laughs> The reason I usually am the most pessimistic, <laughs> on, but not this time, because um, I think once a vaccine is available um, and it's a choice between having the vaccine or living in, in some sort of fear or uncertainty, I think a lot of people who, you know, who now say they would never take it will actually take it. And if you look at the determinants of, of vaccine uptake, uh, around the world, then what you find is that one of the most important factors is ease of access. Um, that is far, a far greater variable than, you know, convincing people, you know, dealing with their attitudes and all that kind of stuff. I mean, for us, again, as, you know, as psychologists, political scientists and all that, these are really interesting issues. But the reality is that if you make it available and you make it easy, 
uh, then a lot more people will will take the vaccine than if, if there is the slightest obstacle. I mean, we know that uh, from experience. So I'm 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 a little worried about this, but I'm not totally worried about it because I think a lot of people will have second thoughts once this is actually available and it does then put an end to to this uh, life changing and world changing event. Right. And um, Wendy, I'll come back to him to say, I just saw a question pop up from uh, Daniel Otungo, who I think is in Nairobi, saying, what's the real motivation behind opposition to vaccines? I don't think it's just fear. So what, what else is going on there? Whitney, do you want to oh, come um, to that? I know you're talking about something else, probably. Uh, well, I mean, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to speak to motivations. That's not a. That's that specific sort of um, conspiracy theory. That sort of thinking is not something that I've personally studied, and don't want to speak for people with whom I've not worked. Um, but but what I will say is that, and maybe others, if anybody wants to jump in, please let me know. Um, but speaking to motivations is less what it is that I do. What I do do, and what then you know is the sort of underlying the catalyst for what I was about to say is my entry point here as a, as a media scholar, I'm, I'm interested in how these stories are amplified. So the question of, you know, to what extent and am I worried about, you know, what happens when the vaccination is available, that has to do with how individual stories are amplified and responded to, not just by everyday people, but also journalists that this is a conversation about how are the narratives being framed, what kinds of strategies are being used to communicate the information to the public. And the thing that I'm most concerned about is the impulse to just treat the conspiracy theories as individual artifacts, to respond to the individual story and just to debunk the individual story, which runs the risk of amplifying in all kinds of sort of uncontrolled ways. And I think it's really important as we move forward, not just for the journalists, but also for everyday people, it's critical to understand that everything in our information ecosystem is connected to itself, that nobody would ever look at a hurricane in the natural world and point to a single gust of wind and, and describe that single gust of wind as the hurricane itself. It is the combination of all the other factors, all the other forces, all the other energies. To really get a handle on the kinds of conspiracy theories that are already fulminating and will only get worse, we need to find better ways to communicate how all of these energies collide, how they contribute to conspiratorial thinking, and how we all fit within that ecosystem. And so I think that responding to stories with that kind of broader picture of how all of this stuff is connected, there is no clear distinction between grassroots and formal amplification. It all feeds into itself. How can we better articulate that and explain that so that people have a better understanding of how to make skillful choices about what to amplify and what not to amplify. So for me, it's not just a question of motivation. It's also a question of amplification and how we can talk to people about making um, more ecologically sensitive choices, knowing that information spreads regardless of what our motivation for spreading it might be. Okay, um, John or Bright, any thoughts on the COVID and vaccines issue? So I, w I was just part of a documentary which aired yesterday, the B a BBC documentary on quack remedies for, for COVID. Mm. And one of the things that I've discovered, so I don't know how many of you have heard of the famous cure discovered in Madagascar, actively promoted by its president. But one of the things that I think we have not touched on sufficiently is this idea of beliefs as status markers. So people are part of a belief network. Um, in some respects, it's ideological, but it's not always ideological because it's not as developed. Belief networks are very powerful. There are times when people will share belief because it's part of being uh, um, a member of a group. And whether or not they believe it is secondary, but they act on the belief or they perpetuate the belief in fascinating different ways. So now there's a search for an African cure. And that will mean, therefore, that if you oppose some kind of quack cure, but it's defined or branded as an African cure, then you are a class traitor or you are a race traitor, etc. Now, those type of belief networks are very powerful. Um, and I think that when we focus on only the cognitive structures of our mind and how it works and forget the social um, mm -hmm. structures within which belief play more than merely a cognitive role, but also play a role in terms of how those formation processes occur, we miss an important element of the discussion. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, John, I'm going to give you the last word. What does the Conspiracy Theories Handbook tell us about how to 
get out of the um, uh, pandemic with vaccine. Well, just to change the subject slightly, I just want to reflect on the fact that, um, uh, I, uh, as I understand it, Stefan Lundowski is probably the most uh, optimistic person on this panel, and that, that could be a historical moment. We should note that. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> with that final word, I'm going to right. hand back to Joan now. Um, we're, we're, it looks like we're just running up against time. So, yeah, I just want to thank all of you for participating in this really interesting discussion today. We did have some questions that we didn't get to. So, if any of you are so inclined, I've just posted them on our Facebook post. And if you want to answer them there, that'd be very welcome. And we'll also be posting um, a video of this too, or be available on YouTube. So, people can, who weren't able to catch the whole thing can watch it there. So thanks again. And then Mark will be on on the 9th talking about his new book, um, Our Final Warning, and he will be interviewed by his daughter. So it should be a <laughs> cute program. Yeah. It should okay. be fun. Congratulations thanks for having us. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you for the discussion. Bye. 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 Why does everyone wave? We all wave. <laughs> I know. <laughs>